Welcome to another episode of Time About the Movies Flashback. We're flashing back to September 30th, 1988, with three films to look at today, so let's not waste any more time. Let's jump right on into it, and we'll start off with the biggest new release of the weekend, Chris Columbus's Heartbreak Hotel. When Johnny's Town said no to rock and roll, please get off the stage, he decided to get some help. Guys, we're going to kidnap Elvis Presley. Now, they're turning the town upside down. You and your band are going to back me up. Heartbreak Hotel, rated PG-13, starts Friday, September 30th. Heartbreak Hotel tells the story of the 17-year-old boy played by Charlie Schlatter, who succeeds in kidnapping Elvis Presley, here played by David Keith, and thus convinces him to meet her mother, who is a fan of his, and has to stand difficult times at the moment. Um, Tuesday Weld, who plays the mom in this, is actually starred with Elvis Presley in a film uh, back in the 1960s, Wild in the Country. But, um... It's an intriguing concept here. This is based off of a story of one of the many legends about Elvis Presley and his fictional kidnapping and his subsequent redemption from decadence. Um, but um, it's, a re it's a really interesting idea on paper, just not the right execution in the long run. This is Chris Columbus who was not – this was before – this was the film he did before he eventually – achieved superstardom with Home Alone. His previous film was Adventures in Babysitting, and then he had been mostly known for his writing work, such as Gremlins and The Goonies. But um, it's a good idea overall, just not the right execution. I mean, the overall acting overall is kind of mediocre at best. The story isn't really all that engaging. It takes a really easy concept that would have been so interesting if he had the right material to work with, except it's just no, it's just kind of a mediocre film. It's a f film that doesn't really go where you think it should go to when it really ha when you have, really have a concept like this. I don't know David. Ke I don't know if maybe David Keith was just the wrong person to play Elvis Presley, but really I don't know who you would have gotten to get him. I saw in one review for this that they suggested Jay Leno, and I don't know. Back then, Jay Leno, I could probably see that kind of working, but um. I mean, I don't know. I, David Keith, I think, did fine in here, but you really did expect a lot more from him in this particular film. But other than that, though, it's a real letdown of a film. It's a film that has a cool concept to it and a good idea to it, just not the right execution overall. And, you know, for Chris Columbus, you expect a lot more from him, but um, this was the last real stumble for him before he eventually went on to become the big director he became in the 90s, starting with his next film, but um, we've already covered that one, so Home, uh, home Alone, by the way. Uh, if you didn't get the idea already, but um, but that's Heartbreak Hotel. So let's go ahead and move on to our next film, which is El Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. Pound, nothing to do but watch the paint dry. I see you've made your famous tic tac tie. Then one day along came. You looking for me? What a bombshell! What a star! Here's dinner. What a So the plot of this is that when a chauvinist millionaire buys a television network where the sexy Elvira is the horror hostess of a late show, she quits her job with the intention of producing her own show in Las Vegas. However, the producers demand fifty thousand dollars from her and Elvira and do not have the does not have the money. And out of the blue, she receives a telegram informing that her great aunt Morgana died, and she has an inherited. A, an inheritance to receive. Elvira drives to the uptight town of Falwell, Massachusetts, where a convertible breaks down. While repairing her convertible, Elvira in inherits an archaic mansion, a recipe book, and a poodle. Her great uncle Vincent Talbot pro proposes to buy her book, but the poodle hides in the so sofa. Meanwhile, the conservative council of Falwell falls uncomfortable with Elvira's clothes and behavior and does not let her find a job, but cinema owner Bob Redding and the local teenagers help Elvira. Uh, when she cooks a dinner to impress Bob, she uses Morgana's recipe and finds that it includes a spell book that belonged to her mother, Devana. Furthermore, Vargana has been protected her from the warlock, Vincent, that wants the book to take over the world and destroy Elvira, who is a powerful witch. When Elvira refuses to sell the book to Vincent, he convinces the council that she is a witch that must be burned at the stake. How will Elvira stop the evil warlock, Vincent? And um, if you think that's about as silly as it gets, that's pretty much what you kind of have to expect with a film like this, because... Yeah, it did not get the best reviews when it came out. It actually got Razzie Awards at the time, but, um, I mean, that's really not saying a whole lot about the Razzies, and especially when you lose out to Liza Minnelli for two other films she did in that year, Arthur II and Run a Cop, but, um, the movie, I think, delivers everything it promises. It's a silly concept. You can definitely tell there's a lot of inspiration from stuff like Ghostbusters and even then Beetlejuice, and in fact, uh, uh, Cassandra Peterson, who plays Elvira, wanted Tim Burton to direct this, but because he got so, um, he got so involved with Beetlejuice, he couldn't direct it. And 
the film overall really does deliver, I think, what it promises. It kind of, you know what it kind of reminds me of? It reminds me a little bit of UHF, a film that was kind of not seen as the, as the good film that it was when it came out. It was actually kind of a dud, but it has gone on to have this cult following over the years. That's what this film really reminds me of. It definitely has a lot of those similar feelings of the UHF movie and this film in general. I think both feel like the same thing. And you can definitely tell they are trying. The effects in here look surprisingly pretty good for the time period. And um, considering they shot this over a span of eight weeks, that's pretty impressive stuff. Plus, you've got a great cast overall to work with. Work with Peterson. You got Susie Kellerman, uh, Edie McClurg from Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Kurt Fuller, Jeff Conway, uh, Tress McNeil's also in here, Frank Welker, Phil Rubenstein. I mean, there's a lot of good talent involved in here, and they do carry the load of the film and allow for the material to work so well here. I think it is a really fun film overall. Not a classic by any means, but it definitely delivers what they're promising you. They're giving you an Avira movie in a funny, enjoyable way. It's a really well-made film for the most part. It does deliver what it promises, It does, and that's pretty much more than you can ask for with, with it. So I highly recommend it. Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. If you didn't get to see it this last Halloween, definitely check it out next Halloween because it's definitely going to be worth it when, when it's all said and done. So, um, so on that note, on to our last film, Clint Eastwood's Bird, starring Forrest Whitaker. The bird of time is but a little way to flutter. Charlie Yardbird Parker, a man who knew no boundaries. Bird, produced and directed by Clint Eastwood. So like I said, Forrest Whitaker plays uh, the title character in here, Charlie Bird Parker, and it's constructed as a montage of scenes from Parker's life from his childhood in Kansas City through his early death at the age of 34, and it moves back and forth through Parker's history, blending moments that find some truth into his life. Much of the film revolves around his only grounding relationships with his wife, played by Diana Verona, and bebop pioneer and Trump player trumpet player and band leader Dizzy Gillespie, played by um, Samuel E. Wright, who of course you know as the voice of Sebastian from The Little Mermaid, and his influence both musically and into the world of heroin addiction of, Trump play, of trumpet player Red Rowney, played by Michael Zelnicker. Um, the film was not well received when it came out in terms of the box office. It did pretty well with critics overall. It did get a couple nominations for Forrest Whitaker, and it was considered to be hit, for him to be his breakout film role. But um, the film did not perform well at the box office. It actually kind of crashed and burned, only making about $2 million over a $14 million budget. And it's gone through, it gone through several different versions. Like, there was one version that Richard Pryor wanted to be involved in, and the project was originally owned by Columbia Pictures, but they traded it with Warner Brothers with the exchange of a film that Columbia would eventually put out, the Kevin Costner star of Revenge. But uh, there was a delay of it for a few years when the trade was completed, and then Pryor pretty much lost interest in that point, so they went to Forrest Whitaker. And um, it's an interesting movie. It's a film that you could definitely tell Clint Eastwood really loved ja He really likes jazz music, and he really wanted to tell the story of Charlie Parker, and he does a pretty good job with it. And he actually went to Chan Parker, his wife, to tell the to for input on the storyline, and basically gave him a collection of lost recordings she kept in a bank vault. And the result is a pretty engaging film. It's a really well-made film, and it does make you see what Forrest Whitaker would eventually become later on down the road. I think it really shows his acting abilities overall when it's all said and done, and he eventually became the great actor that we know him as today. Uh, it's definitely one of Clint Eastwood's most underrated movies. Even if you're not the biggest jazz fan overall, you can still find a lot to really admire about this movie. I, I highly recommend checking it out. Clint Eastwood's Bird, definitely check it out. And so with that said, we wrap up another edition of Time About the Movie's Flashback. When we meet, we'll take a trip back to September 23rd, 1988, to look at David Cronenberg's follow-up to The Fly, Jeremy Irons and Dead Ringers. We also have Kansas, we have Sweetheart's Dance, Spellbinder, Patty Hearst, and Sigourney Weaver in Gorillas in the Mist. So six films to look at next time. We'll delve into those on the next episode. So if you like what you saw, hit the like and subscribe button. Thank you so much for watching. And if you want to see more videos like this, check out the playlist on the next page. Check out the previous episode. And I'll see you guys next week for another episode. So thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Take care.